Good morning. Good morning and welcome to today's NESC Virtual Global Forum, Boarding Schools, Ideas and Innovations for Reopening Safely. We want to begin by expressing our gratitude to each of our panelists for their willingness to share their current thinking and plans, for their creativity and thoughtfulness, and also for their courage to say, this is where we are now. We recognize that none of us has been called to lead our schools through any situation quite like what we're dealing with at this moment, but we do so with a single goal, to keep our students and faculty and school communities safe. My name is Jim Mooney. I'm the Deputy Director of the Commission on Independent Schools, and working with me today is Jeff Bradley, Director of the NEAS Commission on International Education. We thank you educators from across the country and around the world for joining us today. At the most recent count, there's over 900 attendees from 40 countries on this webinar. And thank you very much to everyone for submitting questions with your registration. They've been extremely helpful in our planning for this webinar. Today's forum, like all of our past webinars, and this is our 10th, will be recorded and made available on the NEASC website along with any resources provided during the broadcast. We've created a hashtag NEASC forum and encourage you to use this when you post about today's for forum on any of your social media. This morning, we're gonna hear from heads of seven very different boarding schools, each with distinctive histories and realities, but all with a deep commitment to their respective missions. Please note, that the UWC at Chengsu, China is the only school among those represented today that's already opened its campus. A couple of Zoom tips as we go in. For today's webinar, we have turned on the Zoom chat and the Q&A. Please use the chat to send general messages to other attendees, and then you can use the Q&A to submit questions for the panelists and click on the thumbs up icon next to a posted question to show your interest and to bring our attention to that question. And there are sev several of us will be monitoring the Q&A um, in search of trending questions. Jeff Bradley will be leading the discussion with our panelists and I'll be keeping an eye on the Q&A. An hour won't give us enough time to cover all of the uh, interests that we uh, outlined at this point, of course, but we're gonna do our best to include a few of our questions before the end of this webinar. We'll also keep the option open to extend the time if necessary. So Jeff, I'm gonna hand it off to you for introductions and again, panelists, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Jim. We know from feedback over the last several weeks that boarding schools are a topic of particular and pressing interest to many of you. And we're excited to be able to fulfill the request uh, from many of you uh, to feature these panelists today. And thank you again to our seven panelists. We're gonna be looking at some new ideas, uh, some new visions of education and the potential that might result from the changes that are beginning to take hold um, as a result of this pandemic and the interruptions it has meant to schooling. Much of what you'll hear today are ideas and speculations and in the realm of untried um, innovations, but people doing the best they can with what they have. And our hope is to stimulate reflection around this complex reality of reopening schools and in particular boarding schools. And this could result, as Jim indicated, in more questions than answers today. What I'd like to do next is just have our panelists uh, offer a brief introduction, each of them, um, who they are, and a, a little bit about a background on their school. And we'll start with you, Brad Bates. Hi, I'm Brad Bates, and I am desperately trying to finish my 12th year as head of school at Dublin School. Uh, we're in southwestern New Hampshire, about 80 miles from Boston on the shoulder of Mount Monadnock. We have 165 students right on the smaller end of this group. Uh, we are 75% residential, uh, and I like to say we are currently open and have students on campus. Uh, well, we have three students on campus, but uh, I'm calling this the first phase of our opening as we will continue to add international students throughout the summer. So good to see everyone. Thank you, Brad. 
and uh, Kathy Giles from St. Paul School. Hi, I'm Kathy Giles, St. Paul School in Concord, New Hampshire. We're a fully residential uh, boarding school with 540 students here, uh, roughly 130 uh, faculty and residents, uh, and sort of an overall community of, of around 850 people. Uh, Concord, Concord and New Hampshire in general have uh, escaped much of the COVID uh, wrath with a very low viral uh, incidence rate. Um, we have not had students on campus throughout the spring, but are very optimistic about being able to welcome them back in the fall. Great, thank you, Kathy. John Kearney from the Winchenden School. Hi, I'm John. I'm from uh, Winchenden, as Jeff was saying. Um, we've hit somewhat of the opportunistic trifecta. We have a boarding campus about 60 miles west of Boston with uh, 275 kids on them. About 30% of them or of our revenues or so are derived from international kids. And so we're looking at an interesting fall from that angle. Um, the other two legs of that trifecta, we also have a day campus, a rapidly growing day campus in New York City. And that has been not only the kind of um, hub for, uh, or the hardest hit area in the country for COVID, um, um, but we're also at the center of the very sad unrest against uh, discrimination and prejudice that's going on throughout the country right now. And so um, it's an interesting time. All that being said, we just came off um, uh, the most exciting and, and optimistic board meeting that I've had in my dozen years at the school. And um, so it's a, it's a, it's a very uh, uh, scary time, but also a very exciting time. And we will be open in September. And it just said open represents about six different scenarios right now as to what it could possibly be. But thanks for having us. Thank you, John. Pelham Linfield Roberts from China. Good morning, everyone. Good, good evening if you're on my side of the world. Um, uh, I'm the principal of the United World College of Changsha in China near Shanghai. We have 580 students here um, normally, and all of them residential in grades nine to uh, grades 10 to 12. And uh, we closed for Chinese New Year in, in Jan on January the 22nd, and hoping for a, a short holiday, we ended up with what could have been a long holiday, but has been nothing, nothing like a holiday. And we opened again on May the 6th. Um, and we're now, we now have 180 students on campus. Great, thank you, Pelham. And Mark Ott from Switzerland. Good afternoon, everyone uh, from Switzerland, Les American School in Switzerland, 300 students, all boarding. We are uh, entirely international. We do not have a, a local population. Uh, and um, we closed quite early in March because the pandemic hit quite early on. However, the situation right now in Europe and in particular in Switzerland looks quite well. And yes, we will be reopening in September. Thanks, Mark. Okay, uh, Dr. Kate Windsor from Connecticut. Hi, my name is Kate Windsor and I'm head of uh, the Miss Porter School in Farmington, Connecticut. All girls boarding and day school two-thirds boarding and a third day. Um, the last line in our mission statement says that we expect our graduates to shape a changing world, which means that we prioritize anti-racist work and justice for all. And at this moment, I'd like to implore all of my colleagues and leaders in schools to prioritize this work um, as you think about your plans to reopen um, as a result of COVID-19. Um, it's clear that our black students and other students of color have been disproportionately um, impacted by COVID-19 and certainly are also impacted uh, by the racial unrest here in our country. So um, while we're here to talk about the reopening through the lens of COVID-19, um, it's essential that uh, we prioritize this anti-racist work as well. Thank you. Thanks, Kate. And Dr. Jennifer Zakara from Vermont. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jennifer Zakara, the head of Vermont Academy. We are a small boarding school of about 200 students in rural Vermont. We have about 450 acres around us in a small little country store. Uh, we uh, had online learning for the spring and we plan to open 
uh, this fall. We may actually open a little bit earlier and more on that later, uh, taking advantage of our location and the weather. Uh, Vermont has very good statistics right now, so uh, we want to take advantage of that opportunity. I agree with all that we are now juggling multiple uh, challenges, both the pandemic and recent events, and so we're all called upon uh, a higher uh, order of what we need to do as heads of school. So I'm looking forward to this conversation, and hello. All right, thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. So let's start with the big question about plans for the fall. Uh, we had a chance to connect with all of you uh, late last week um, and we heard um, a lot of plans underway uh, and a lot of variety. And so what we'd like to do right now is just have each of you speak for a minute or two, um, highlighting a little bit about your context, your local context, um, and what plans you are developing. Um, and already we've heard of alternate scenarios that you're considering and that you're working with um, at this point. So if you could just give us that um, kind of broad overview of what the plans look like right now within your school, uh, we would, we'd appreciate that. And let's start with um, Pelham, the um, head who has already welcomed students back to campus. What you're doing today and what you're planning on for the fall. So thank you. Um, UWC Changshu was founded in 2000 and 15 and is one of 18 UWCs, uh, drawing students from 155 different national committees around the world. 100% residential and 50% of our students are from China and currently they're able to come back and 50% are from elsewhere from 100 different countries. Um, uh, the UWC mission emphasizes specific universal values, peace, social justice, environmental responsibility. And our pedagogy has a focus on critical engagement, leadership, for social benefit and emphasize the importance of community and the value of diversity. Uh, we closed for the Chinese New Year holiday on the 22nd of January and we were due to assemble on the 5th of February at a time when, when no one outside of China really knew anything about the coronavirus. Um, and we had to tell our students and our faculty that they, they couldn't come back to campus and they had to leave. And so that created a logistic challenge of getting 250 students on flights overseas. Um, uh, we, had, we then had all the problems of trying to relocate examination centers before the IB exams were canceled and we extended our school day, sorry, our school year by two weeks and we offered a refund of the residential costs. Um, recently we were able to open on the 6th of May for 180 students in China who could get to our campus and we now have about 40 faculty back on campus and a complexity of another 40 uh, who are elsewhere around the world. In reopening, um, the local authorities helped us by providing an NAT test for all the returning staff and students. And um, we've had the, the challenge of returning normality for the 180 students on campus um, so that they gain value from being on campus, uh, whilst also continuing the education for about 100 of our first year IB students who, are, who remain overseas in different time zones, delivered by faculty who are, who are on campus as well as faculty who are overseas. The challenge we have um, is, is that it's impossible for any foreign student or any faculty to get back to China currently. Um, and we don't know what that restriction will look, when that restriction will be lifted. Um, so hiring more teachers in key subject areas, for example, Chinese, maths, and English. Um, one of the innovations we're working on is, is pedagogically, um, I think we should have all flipped our classrooms long ago. And this enforced pedagogy um, creates professional learning uh, through the distance learning program. So using more collaborative technology has enabled us to work together and emphasize and support student autonomy and focus. And the situation also reminds us that the world is a complicated, complex place. And so this is really an opportunity to engage with, with the problems and make something, make something of it. Um, it's been a long semester since January and we're looking forward to holiday. All right, thank you, Pelham. I know we're gonna come back uh, to some of your reality there as well. And it, it, it's worth mentioning uh, and reminding everybody that your school is part of a network, the United World College, uh, as you indicated, that is dealing with this uh, situation in many other countries as well. Um, let's turn to Jennifer in Vermont uh, in terms of plans that you are envisioning for the fall. Yes, thank you. Uh, we started off by creating a planning group that 
that had board members in addition to executive team members here. And then we've recently layered in some experts in various fields uh, so that we can get solid medical advice and supplies and things of that sort. Uh, that has been a vibrant uh, working group that has been meeting once a week with subcommittees and uh, it helped us to realize that we have two different scenarios we're looking at. One would be that we would open on campus with our regularly scheduled time and offering hybrid learning for our international students or anyone who is unable to come to campus. Uh, and then we're also looking at an early opening, uh, taking advantage of the summer and our campus and uh, the opportunity to, to have more social distancing available were we to start early. We're a school with a trimester system and we're exploring whether we want to go to semesters this year, keep the trimesters, uh, really keeping a flexible outlook on scheduling and, and other uh, space needs. Uh, we're basically looking at making a map of our campus so that while we've always had safety uh, and processes, right now we really have to have a map that includes almost having a high level medical uh, availability on campus. So uh, you will have a space for quarantine, for example, a space for temperature taking uh, and, um, you know, making sure the students have the, and everyone has proper uh, masks and protective equipment. Um, I don't want to lose sight of the fact, as we were saying, that other things are going on in the world. And I'm so proud of the fact that we're also a student-centered school and that our students have been writing me uh, already about things that have been happening and really creating social justice and equity groups and so on. So uh, we intend to have students right at the center of all of our decisions around COVID planning and even to engage them as we have our discussions going forward. Um, in, every, in every situation, there's an opportunity and we are right on, uh, poised on uh, a future where we're at an educational paradigm shift even before the pandemic. So I don't wanna lose sight of, of what we can do right now in this situation to offer students the very best opportunities for the future and some skill sets that they're going to need for this world that, that we're entering. Uh, not losing any positivity or hope either because it's very important. We're the guardians of these students and we need to make sure that they can find a hopeful path forward uh, to be leaders of the future. Uh, so I'm looking forward to the further conversation uh, and we, we, are, we have a flexible model at the moment and uh, we're excited about uh, delivering the best possibilities for our community. Okay, thank you Jennifer. And Mark, in Switzerland, um, you're 100% residential I know um, and are embedded in a network of other uh, Swiss boarding schools, one of which I used to uh, be in charge of. So tell us a little bit about your context um, heading into the fall. Um, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, obviously Switzerland is, is getting out of it. it. The government just last week declared the first uh, wave of the pandemic over. Um, the borders are gradually gonna open up uh, in the next couple of weeks. Uh, uh, the Schengen area is scheduled to open early July. And obviously uh, we also hope that international air travel is gonna follow uh, consequently around that. Um, so that, that's already the context we're in. Obviously, it does not exclude that things could have to tighten up again if there is a second wave. Um, I think I'd like to maybe just make one point is I think uh, as much as we're also a very much a mission-driven driven school, I think it's important we also take care of the faculty. Uh, and um, the faculty and, and staff have gone through a tremendous amount. So what one of the things I did was we also revamped our entire professional development program already starting this summer to help train our teachers uh, also during the year around a flexible model of teaching and learning next year, which we believe is going to be needed. Um, concretely, what we did is we, we essentially closed one of our dorms, which we're going to use as our care center uh, for when kids come in, test, and we need to wait for the results, or if t kids are indeed uh, testing positive, as well as if we have to isolate other kids that are in contact. So we're essentially artificially reducing our, um, uh, our capacity. Uh, and uh, ironically, I just got the admissions data um, just this morning that at this point, we're going to have to start looking at maybe even capping the number of students based on the last data. 
However, I, I'm not quite ready to go down that road because obviously we, we don't know what we don't know. Another, I think, important thing that we did is we made essentially two timetables. One is the standard one, which we want to all, all operate on. And the other one is essentially a Tuesday, Thursday afternoon off, um, where essentially the kids who are here are going to do different activities. And then the faculty will have the opportunity to teach kids who are not here. So the second one would be a sort of an assumption that a critical mass of kids are not be able to make on campus, that we can also give the time and space to teachers to teach those kids all around the world and still provide a high level of, uh, uh, of educational service to every student, whether they're on campus or off campus. Thank you, Mark. Let's move to Kate. Uh, you, un, you, un, there you go. Yeah. Thank you. Here in Connecticut, um, the state has issued a uh, path of report, uh, the path to reopen for higher ed and boarding schools. And this morning also issued a path to reopen for our independent K-12 schools. So I encourage people to take a look at that. I have found as a leader, it has been super helpful with respect to some of the practical um, uh, work that needs to be done and then overlay that on um, the unique situation that Ms. Porter's school finds itself in. Um, we've done several things. One is to really look at what are the resources that we have um, uh, due to our location, our school, so that we're not, uh, we're amplifying those and not uh, also repeating those. So an example would be our use of um, the local medical facilities. So we have uh, multiple hospitals within several miles of school um, uh, include, uh, and other um, facilities like Jackson Labs, which we could access to provide testing, to provide quarantining, to provide um, a whole ho host of services. So we put that aside um, as we think about what are the things that we um, need to be doing ourselves as an institution. Uh, like Jennifer, really thinking about the people and the students. Um, and I'll go back to um, some of the work around um, being anti-racist and also um, equitable for all. We um, are thinking deeply about our Asian and Asian presenting students um, and the xenophobia and racism that they um, could expect to experience when they re-enter Farmington, Connecticut. Um, also thinking about the ways in which we need to support students um, uh, as we toggle what we expect back and forth between some online learning and remote learning and in-person learning. So our goal is to bring girls back to campus, but we also expect to be closing school um, after the Thanksgiving break and not return until sometime in January, uh, because we don't believe that it would be a good idea to be sending girls um, to six continents and 23 states and then bringing them back again um, for a short period of time. So what does that mean and what sorts of resources um, do we need to double down on? both respect to financial resources and um, access, but also thinking about um, uh, time zones and um, how we provide a synchronous learning for students who are on the West Coast and Asia um, and around, around the globe. Um, we did a decent job of that uh, as we closed out the school year based on our uh, use and commitment to remote learning um, you know, over time. Um, but we need to be doing a better job of that going forward. All right, thanks, Kate. Definitely some lessons learned from the spring. And we'll have a chance to talk a little bit more about um, creative use of space and time um, as well, I think, um, going forward here in just a few minutes. Uh, let's turn to Brad from Southern New Hampshire. Hi, and, and I just want to thank Kate for speaking up. And um, I think I speak for all our panelists when I say that we're thinking of our colleagues of color out there on this webinar and that, and all of our students, alumni and staff as well. So I appreciate uh, you bringing that up, Kate. Um, I wanna preface my remarks by saying we have a great deal to figure out at Dublin uh, before we can announce our specific plans for August. I think for us, testing is probably the biggest question we are working on 
right now, and I look forward to learning what other people are doing about that. Um, I'll say one of the silver linings of the spring has been working with other heads of schools and regular collaborative meetings. Uh, Jennifer and I meet with about 10 other heads uh, twice a week, and that's been extremely powerful. And I think it's creating kind of a, a new path forward for our schools. And I, if you don't have a collaborative group like that, uh, a small group, I highly recommend it. In addition to these kinds of webinars, it's very powerful. Um, we have uh, two main task force on our campus. One's designed for safety and health, and the other is for the academic portion. And then every division head, like athletics, is working on athletic program. Um, and anyone who reports to me has their own kind of projects they're working on for the opening of school. Um, I'm, I'm pretty hopeful about opening, and, and I see this as a kind of a rising tide raises all ships moment for boarding schools. Um, and I think if we all work together, we can truly position boarding schools for an exciting future coming out the other end. Um, and I think our schools are going to be stronger because of all the collaboration that's taking place uh, this spring and, and heading into next year. So I'm, I'm excited about that. I think it's going to make it easier for us all to open by working together. Um, I think we're really focused on how we can leverage what we have on our campus with our location. We're a very remote area um, and uh, we have a lot of acreage. And our goal is to create a bubble, take advantage of our small size and location. Um, and I'm, I'm really thinking about how do we uh, reimagine our campuses to one, make them safe and two, to create opportunities for learning, exploration, travel, experiential education, field trips, research, vacations, since we're eliminating um, our fall breaks and things and, and our ability to get away on weekends. Um, and how do we do this so we can keep our kids safe by not traveling? Um, Obviously, we're thinking about uh, how we recapture space for um, larger classes, especially at the beginning of the year. Like, how do we get six classrooms in our gymnasium? Uh, we have yurts on campus, and we're thinking of adding more yurts and possibly tents to create, create more spaces uh, to, keep, to keep our kids really in fresh air and uh, have more space than our typical classrooms. Um, we're also reaching out to local summer camps to see if we can possibly rent them for the opening weeks of school as one idea, or having some of our grades camp out on campus for 10 days. Uh, this makes it a lot easier to create so social isolation. Um, also thinking we could create a pretty cool orientation program around this experience. We even have day schools in Boston coming up to our area to do this for two weeks already uh, in the past. So why, why aren't we doing this when we already live here. Um, as far as calendar is concerned, we have asked our families and our faculty and staff to be super flexible and to say keep August 15th to July 15th open. And our goal is to guarantee three 10-week trimesters on campus one way or another. Um, and we will have distance learning for anyone who cannot return, but uh, we're just going uh, kind of like some of these other schools start early, um, go as far into the fall as we can, probably take a break for, for a significant period of time and then come back when the weather's nice and the vaccine's here and uh, go a little bit further into summer than we usually do. All right, thank you, Brad. A lot of good points there. And I see trending here some uh, good, really good questions um, about roommates, about sports, about the hybrid schedule that we're hearing about. So we'll get into that in just a moment, but I wanna hear a little bit more about um, opening intro plans um, and we'll turn to you, Kathy, at St. Paul's School in New Hampshire. Thank you. Um, I'm, gonna not, I'm gonna try not to repeat uh, what other people have already said, but I think one of the fascinating processes for all of us is that it's such an iterative process that, it, that we need to limit the time that we run down the rabbit holes of speculation and really stay focused on what we think can be helpful in our thinking. Um, and also remember that uh, we're, we all of us work with people uh, who, of extraordinary capacity and good heart and good spirit. So that even though I think a lot of us as heads of school wake up every morning, you know, feeling this wrapped around our, our, our necks, um, on the other hand, it, it's also an opportunity for a lot of people in our communities to show leadership um, and, and to get caught, as we like to say, get caught being good. So let's catch as many people being good as we can uh, through this whole thing and, and sort of build that good community spirit. Um, here, here at St. Paul's, and, and I think as we've talked, you know, we're in the middle of New Hampshire, 
if there's anything I've learned is that there's not, this is the original one size does not fit all situation. Mm -hmm. um, local politics are going to govern, local regulations are going to govern, and it's really very important to have good relationships with your governor, uh, with people on those task forces, uh, and with local, uh, both public health authorities and the local medical people. Um, for example, if when we get to the testing question, right now, at least with us, um, the local hospital, there's a local hospital in a big state, um, Dartmouth-Hitchcock Healthcare System. The local hospital has an unpredictable supply of um, an uh, antigen tests. Um, so we are going to need to, and, and we are, you know, gathering resources from all different kinds of places, whether it's Quest Diagnostics or Abbott Laboratories, whether it's buying um, the Sophia machine that, that uh, can provide at least initial rapid response testing on campus. Understanding that there isn't going to be a one-size-fit-all, that as Kate says, some, of, some states are coming out with terrific guidelines to help us but that there are other organizations that are also doing that and making sure that the good information comes to us. And I know that, for example, the American Camp Association a couple of weeks ago put out a terrific manual that I think a lot of small day schools can get a lot of mileage of about how to reopen. And there's a terrific organization in Newton, Massachusetts, the um, Environmental Health and Engineering that worked on that, that is also gonna be working with a number of boarding schools. Um, so, you know, local, it, this is local, 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 and I think it's really important to reinforce those good connections and to deploy, whether it's your parents or your trustees or your faculty members who've lived in the community for a long time, get the, you know, get those good connections with resources so you're part of that conversation. I think it's really, really important to reinvest in distance learning right now. Um, unlike Pelham, um, I'm not a believer in the flipped classroom. We really believe that learning is a social emotional event and that it works best um, in person and, and in presence of others. And, you know, like Kate, we've, at, at uh, Ms. Porter's, you know, we've, we've done a decent job this year, but we've, we've focused on that personal connection uh, with our students, with advisors. And I think that's a hallmark of independent schools and one of our strengths. Um, so to the extent that we make sure that we've got a hand on every child, even if the child isn't here or can't be with us, that's very important. And it also gives our faculty the sense of moving forward when we do emphasize professional development in distance learning. So a distance learning task force is, is really important because anyone who uses that word pivot to describe what we've had to do in going from in-person classrooms in our communities to you know, world teaching, uh, that, that word does, does not do justice to the amount of work we've had to do. Um, we have to develop the reasonable uh, standard of COVID-19 care. That's gonna be different than the reasonable standard of care that we have had in the past. That's gonna require us to get, to, be, to get very good local information, to align ourselves with the CDC, even if what comes out of the CDC is confusing and inconsistent. Um, but it's also gonna require us to have a very good understanding of the specifics of what our policies are gonna be. So at St. Paul's, we're working on what that reasonable standard of care, the reasonable standard of boarding school care uh, can look like in, uh, in, in COVID-19 times. But, you know, sort of the big questions we're, we're working on, are we going to be comfortable in the absence of readily available, affordable, rapid response testing? Are we going to be comfortable with surveillance test, symptom testing in our community? We're getting some good advice on that, that the answer to that can be yes. But that's the kind of, of question we're working on. We're working on safety and health just the way everyone else is. Safety, health, cleaning. What is our dining hall going to look like? How can we change our schedule when we're here together to go to the dining hall and shifts? What would some party tents with lights outside and in, in the center of campus look like to get kids out there, making sure that our, our internet and our technology resources are strong outside as well as inside? And again, getting some consulting help um, both in terms of infectious disease and in terms of um, what the facility actually looks like, the quality of the airflow in our buildings. We, we're, we're telling everybody uh, today to go out and buy a fan and plan to bring it with you. Um, we're, we're also following the, the, um, the Connecticut group and, and Kate just put that, uh, posted that link up today. Um, the plans for repopulating campus, for monitoring health conditions, for containment to when, when we get the positive kid, and a plan for shutdown in the case of the, those are all going to need to be plans that we have. And as, and as, and I, I know from my time on the commission, 
that some schools are small and, and those resource, you know, developing those plans are going to really stress your resources. But that's where I think you can, you can build, you know, pull in the help, you know, the parent who's got a legal eye, the parent who's got a friend who's a, the head of the travel clinic at your local hospital. You know, pulling in people to help with those plans, as, as Jennifer was saying, um, not, only, not only creates a better plan, but it builds the trust and confidence that we are going to need to bring to our leadership for, the, for our communities here. Um, and then finally, you know, we're talking about whether, frankly, in terms of de-densifying our campus, we want to we want to um, incentivize distance learning in any way. Are there families for whom the fear factor is going to be so big that they want to stay with us, but they just can't come to campus? So, you know, if we, as, as um, one of the colleagues was saying, if we, Mark was saying, if we actually need to decrease the number of students that we have, we are going to have to adjust our financial model. But would we want to incentivize distance learning at all to do that? And then secondly, what would happen if we thought of um, the distance learning and the synchronous learning, the in-person learning on a parallel track, and we offered families multiple points of entry? So you can come uh, in September, or you can come at the end of, you know, October 15th, or you can come in January, and we'll keep you to pace uh, with our, dist our strong distance learning program. Um, but if we're going to save a place for you, you're going to pay, uh, you're going to pay us to do that. So as we're thinking about our financial models, I think we also have to make sure that we're working with what, you know, the choices that we're asking families to make. Last thing for me, um, I have uh, got some great advice and great work with colleagues, but it's really clear that where we were three months ago is not where we are now, is where we're not, you know, where we're going to be three months from now. And I think all the signs are going in the right direction um, for, for a good, robust reopening. For example, I think the, the quarantine period I'm advised is going to shrink from 14 days down. Uh, and I'm also going to be advised that the be I've been advised that the better we get at wearing masks, um, the less of a crisis we're going to have when a child or a colleague tests positive. Thank you, Kathy. So many important points you've raised there. Um, let's get to John uh, with your plans at Winchenden for the fall. Um, awesome stuff for my colleagues. Thanks, guys. Yeah, I, I, we have a lot of what everybody else has talked about. I really appreciated uh, Kathy bringing up the synchronous um, piece and thinking about how we um, deliver very vibrant digital classrooms and advisee programs that are um, just as um, kinesthetic, just as one-on-one um, -on -one as our current on-campus learning experiences. And I think that there's been, you know, we've gotten through this first phase and I'm delighted that our families seem very happy. Um, the bar is going to be at a whole nother level if we have to go extended distance learning again. And we are very likely to as everybody's pointed out, to have some period of that. So we are focused on, that's made us think about schedule. We immediately in March um, restructured our schedule, our daily schedule quite a bit to keep in mind that we do have synchronous learners who have to join us um, from 20 different countries. It doesn't work at Winchin and on an asynchronous basis for so much of our learning. Um, and we are gonna carry that into the fall. I think it's highly likely that we will have um, some meaningful number of classes operated or offered in the evenings, um, especially learning strategies offered in evenings um, so that we can have kids from four different continents all participating in a time frame that works, um, things like that. Um, I don't want to go too much else in the program because much better things have already been said. I think the one other element that I would leave in, and, and Kathy started to get into this a little bit, we're going to have to be very flexible um, for our families and in, in how they re-enter because there's our point of view as to when it's good to re-enter or when it's good to return to our campuses and we we will have a time when we think that we can um, um, provide a very safe campus and then our families are going to have a very different perspective as to when it's time to rejoin our schools and 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 respecting and even supporting that fluid re-entry is going to be very important um, and so we are looking, um, because um, at least for us, affordability is a huge issue for our parents right now. We are already hearing from the parents who've been furloughed, who are uh, at risk of furlough or at risk of change in economic circumstances. Many of them are already living in places that they didn't anticipate to be living. 
Um, you know, we have a lot of kids on the New York campus whose families have left the city for an undetermined amount of time. That same dynamic is going to come to play in the boarding schools. And so we will have a flexible, uh, a more flexible tuition plan and are rolling that out to our families very soon. It was board approved this past weekend um, so that we can give them that some comfort that we recognize um, that, that this is really hard on them financially as well and that they're incurring um, uh, additional expenses too. Um, so um, that's another piece that I would encourage people to um, look at, at the opportunities for is, is some sort of flexible tuition approach. At least it's important for our families. And as someone rightly said, we're all on a different boat. Um, and so we need to figure out what's right for our, each our own schools. Thank you, John. Many of you have touched on some really big questions around um, use of time um, and thinking flexibly. Um, John, you mentioned, and I know you're not the only one um, who will be having courses taught synchronously in the evenings in order to accommodate students uh, on the other side of the world, like Pelham is right now in China. So um, you're also talking a little bit about space and how to use space and how to create space and distance when that is somewhat counter to what, we're, what we normally preach, which is come together. But now we're telling people to stay apart. You all have a unique challenge because you are at boarding schools. And what I'd like to do is go right to a concrete question about residential life. And it's the question of roommates. Mm -hmm. um, one of those kind of cornerstones and hallmarks of the residential uh, school experience is having a roommate or two or three. Um, and I'm curious if maybe I'll start with Kate, uh, because I know um, um, you have some thoughts on this. How are you approaching this question of roommates for the fall? Yeah, yeah, thank you, Jeff. Um, so we really are thinking about two things, sort of how we can optimize space and time and also um, uh, human behavior. Uh, so as Kathy said, lots of things are going to change uh, between now and the fall in terms of what is best practices. And so, uh, but we know uh, that we will have uh, adolescents on campus and we can, we can guess what our density will look like and really trying to lean into, as Kathy said, you know, catching people being good and what does that look like. The state of Connecticut has said to us that we can treat uh, roommate groups and suite groups as a family group. So um, instead of doing singles um, or, or working towards that, we actually will be doing um, uh, having doubles, triples, and even quads when you think about a sweet group. And that group will be then treated as a family group in the same ways in which um, <clears throat> when you're at home, you're treated as a, as a single unit with respect to contact, uh, quarantining, and... Um, uh, and again, I, want, I, I do want to make a uh, differentiate between quarantining and isolation. So if someone is sick, they need to be isolated. If they potentially have had contact um, or we are in that period where we're determining whether or not they're sick, they would be in a quarantining um, uh, position. We also are thinking about taking our roommates um, and creating dorms that are also sort of uh, groups um, that would limit contact and also create more community. So at Miss Porter's school, we have vertical housing, meaning that we have um, ninth through 11th graders living together um, in, in single dorms. We will go to horizontal housing is the expectation. So for example, you might have a group of ninth graders um, all in one uh, dorm and we do have residential scale uh, boarding. So they're smaller, so you could have 10 or 12 girls. The roommates would be treated, treated as a family unit and then the dorm will be treated as a unit. Um, we are not looking to replicate many of the large group functions. Uh, for example, we will not be looking to replicate um, eating in the dining hall, uh, but we could imagine serving um, meals in the dorms and it, it'll, it will be different, but it's going to be different in the dorm as well. I think that for, for the first time we will have every, just like the fans, um, we will allow a refrigerator in every room 
and um, and we will stock those refrigerators um, with breakfast items, for example, so that that, that unit um, can eat together um, in their room and have breakfast. We are expecting that for our boarding students, um, we're um, looking into with the food service, having them come back to the dorm and eat lunch and dinner in the common room. It does allow for us to build community and also limit the contact that will happen. Uh, building out a schedule <clears throat> Uh, using a true try and a block schedule so that those girls, for example, could all go over um, to the humanities building and they would go into one classroom and the teacher would come in and out of that classroom as opposed to building out schedules that we typically have where the goal is to have um, girls, uh, uh, diversity of girls in the dorm, also going to a diverse set of classes and all moving out, but we will limit contact. So it's a more long-winded answer to thinking about the ways in which you can use your residential life program mm -hmm. actually to create smaller groups that both meet that goal of building community within your mm -hmm. school, but also limiting contact. Um, so Thank that you. will move at, at, as a group around campus. Yeah, and you emphasize that um, the idea of a roommate is treated as a family member, which after right. all is kind of what we think of anyway, even pre-pandemic. Um, but it's an interesting measure to take that would allow you to conduct life somewhat um, as you did before um, with roommates. And I'm curious if others have um, thoughts so on the that, roommate question too. That's one thing to say that that means, you, you know, you wouldn't have masks, you wouldn't have dividers, you wouldn't have those things within that room. But it also means that girls can't invite other girls into their room. Right, so, so we're not coming in and out of the room the way they do all, all day long, that th that room would be sort of sacrosanct for that, that group of uh, two, three, four girls. Um, mm -hmm. And the same thing then applies to bathrooms um, around that, where we would assign specific bathrooms, and even a schedule for girls going in and out um, of, those, of those bathrooms. Right, great. Anyone else, I know we're um, running short on time, um, so many things we could be talking about. I you know, the financial question has come up as well, um, tuition, um, um, and that is probably a, su a subject for another webinar um, at another time. So we are seeing those questions and um, comments coming in, um, and we're not going to be delving into that today, but thank you for that input. Other points about roommates and strategies for roommates that maybe take it um, in a different direction from what Kate has talked about happening at Miss Porter's. Uh, Pelham, sure, go ahead. Uh, unmute, yeah. Uh, so, so one of the challenges we're facing here is that the government requires quarantine and it's currently for anyone coming into the country and the challenge is, so I'm very interested, we'd, we'd love to create a family, a family unit if we could, but it's, it's single and a family member could come with, with a student. So currently we can't, we can't bring students for safeguarding reasons in because we just don't feel it's reasonable to isolate a student of six, 15 or 16 years old for, for two weeks, which is the current requirement. So it's, it's really difficult um, to consider how we, how we do that. So um, that's one challenge. One of our, one of our schools has um, rented a hotel where they can isolate students, they can do the test and then put them in the hotel and they've, they've already booked the hotel for the beginning of August so that they can, they can run through a process of testing and after two or three days, then they can get them onto campus. It's been interesting for me how how some of you are talking about possibly having a positive case on campus, because for me, that's pretty unthinkable. Um, you know, once, once we've got a case on campus, I, I feel that we're going to be in a, in a really difficult scenario. For sure. Let's, um, let's talk a little bit. Uh, oh, so go ahead, Mark. Yeah, about um, roommates in the new normal. Uh, maybe, maybe just a general comment. I mean, obviously, a lot of the kids come to us to see a different part of the world and to travel around, whether it's the nearby city, region, country. Uh, and, and um, you know, certainly we're, we're look, that's one of the reasons why certainly a lot of kids go to Swiss boarding schools. Uh, and for us, I mean, right now, that is all entirely open on how we're gonna operate with uh, any weekend travel, whether it's day travel, overnight travel, or even school-sponsored trips, but but I think it's something that one has to keep in mind as we move forward. All right, thank you, Mark. Um, I want to also um, ask about communications and how you all, in your role, are um, making your plans clear to your to your audience. Um, 
of parents, of, of staff, of alumni even. Um, and I don't know, maybe Kathy, if I can pick on you, because I I'm, I'm actually received St. Paul's communications as well myself. So uh, do you have some strategies or thoughts on uh, to share on how you're getting the message across? Sure. I think we need to understand that the fear factor is huge and that uh, the trust in the voices of authority uh, has been badly damaged. So, you know, just the, just the confusion and misinformation and politicization about the use of masks is a really good example of that here in the, here in the U.S. Um, so what we're, we're, the goal of our communication is to rebuild trust and confidence. Um, we're starting now with our, with our community. You know, again, we've been blessed in New Hampshire with a low viral load. And we actually haven't had to close down the school completely the way many of you have had to do that. But pulling people back into work is the first step. Um, and I'm going to just call out Deerfield Academy for creating a super back to work survey, very simple, um, that allows all of our adults in our community, faculty and staff to express their concerns so that we can, we can hear them, we can address them, we can know them. We're going to do the same with our, with our students and families. Um, we're, 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 we're going to do, we're assuring everybody that this is phasing in, that we're all, while we're all learning about this together, actually people do know things about virus, infectious disease, um, people do know what to do, and that, and that there's going to be a plan to, to come out of this. So trust, confidence, and optimism are big for us. Making sure that you have very good information from people outside your organization is important. And I think the, you know, the stream of resources here is really helpful. We're keeping a bibliography of that because there are some, you know, if you curate these materials, um, they can be helpful to your families and not just the overwhelming news media. Again, limiting the time we spend speculating and worrying and maximizing the time we spend, you know, productively thinking and planning. Um, so th those are a key for us, you know, this idea that flexibility is big. We're, we're socializing a lot. I've got a, a big long uh, letter, you know, yesterday's letter was about um, the violence and racism. Today's letter is about, here's what we all need to start thinking about as we're getting excited about the fall. What about roommates? What about interviews? What about sports? We're working on all of it. Get your good health habits down. Get used to wearing a mask. Those are non-negotiable. There's going to be no political conversation. Good health measure. So socializing compliance. I think for all of us who are trying to work, we're, we're working with, you know, we're trying to stay in touch with Dartmouth and the University of New Hampshire system, as well as places like Yale and Brown that are doing really good work. Everyone's worried about that compliance piece. And I think we have to start that in our, in our, edu in our community education as well. And then also, and I hate to be this voice here, but pay attention to your liability issues. Um, and in your communications, you know, we're, we're starting to let everybody know that when we come out with our plan on July 1, um, we're going to also be coming out with an addendum to our enrollment contract. Um, in New Hampshire, we've been advised that our workers' comp uh, structure in the state would cover uh, liability issues arising out of employment. But beginning to socialize all of these, um, all of these ideas and, not, and, and, and remember that we're spending all of our time right now, or most of our time right now, worrying about this. And we've got to keep everybody with us. So staying in good touch with your board. Zoom calls are, are a terrible way to hold a board meeting. But, um, you know, we've been doing some drop-in office hours for board members. You know, there's a board presentation, and then there's a couple of scheduled hours where my CFO and I are, are available for questions and for conversations. We're getting some really good feedback. Um, that you know and incorporating into the thinking but you know finally make it community think and don't surprise anybody right. you know I think that's yeah. the yeah and all of you have said in various ways how you are leaning into this moment and how you are connecting and reconnecting with your with your networks and with your local uh, resources uh, in your area a really important um, feature I want to um, announce that we will go beyond the uh, top of the hour for those of you panelists who and um, our audience who can stay on because we do have some other questions we want to um, get to and um, including a question about day uh, day students and how they integrate with borders. But before we do that, what I'd like to do is get just a quick summary sort of conversation um, if we can or not a conversation but comments. Um, 
about how you as a head of a boarding school are, are taking advantage of this moment and seeing maybe a silver lining through this. Um, and just one minute each, if you don't mind. Jennifer, we'll start with you. Yes, I, I actually love this question. Uh, I'm somebody who always looks for opportunity uh, in tough times. And we are uh, at Vermont Academy uh, poised to embrace our new strategic plan that really focuses on 21st century skills and, and some uh, opportunities for students to prepare for the future. So if we think about the situation that we all have where we're going to be on our campuses more and not having fluid movement off campus as much, uh, we can really start and pilot some of those uh, innovation uh, opportunities, entrepreneurship, uh, getting some skills in computer areas with coding and data analytics and so on uh, that can be really exciting and engage the faculty as well in these new pilot uh, pilot programs. So we're hoping to do that. Um, we also uh, see opportunity in helping everyone to develop good habits. These, these things that we're talking about are very challenging. And as we all know, it takes weeks to develop new habits. So we have to have new habits around our COVID uh, experiences, our social distancing, et cetera, in a broader context when we bring everybody back to school. Sure. Um, I'm, I'm also just very focused on wellness. Uh, this is tough for everybody, for adults and students, and I think we really have to step up our care of each other, whether it's through uh, counseling or, you know, strong advisory programs, coaching. We haven't really talked about athletics, but Physical activity is super important, and we hope to continue opportunities uh, both on campus with player development around our MAPS program where students strategize for their own success. But also, as Brad was mentioning, we talk uh, regularly with the Lakes Region uh, heads of school, and we are two of them. And uh, we're, you know, we're, we may do some creative things uh, like dividing up our normal league into more local competitions mm -hmm. that just sort of go straight for the competition and come back without any yeah, segue. I think that's a, it. Actually, that topic is probably going to be the focus of another webinar the whole question about athletics and activities. And I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. And John, do you have some thoughts just to summarize? how you are gonna make the most of this moment as a boarding school head? Um, I come at things a little bit differently. I think that um, I, I referred to it as the opportunistic trifecta in my opening remarks. Um, I just encourage, especially the smaller schools, um, you know, history shows us that times of massive disruption like the ones we're in and we're in, and this is truly unprecedented. unprecedented. Um, uh, it hasn't happened at least in any of our lifetimes, something like this, this kind of opportunity. Um, both of these terrible events are also great levelers, if there's any silver lining. Um, you know, many of our small schools feel like we somewhat live in the shadows of wealthier schools and bigger schools, um, but it isn't money or tenured faculty or fancy facilities that are gonna drive the most interesting innovation. It's our ability to mobilize our teams around good thinking. And that's the opportunity that we all have. Um, that's a much lower cost opportunity than building a uh, you know, substantial campus improvement right now or something or building endowment. Um, there are things, some of the most important thinking that come out of this is very likely to come from smaller schools or people who are resource starved um, um, because we've got to be really responsive in serving our, our students and their families. And so it's a huge, huge opportunity. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, thank Thanks, you, John. Brad. Seeing this as a, uh, as a learning opportunity for all of us. Uh, and again, I know we're getting right up against the 10 o'clock hour. Kate, I know you need to run. So I'm going to turn to you just for um, your thoughts on how you're going to lean into this. And then again, we will extend beyond the, the 10 o'clock uh, a.m. Eastern time hour for those of you who can stay on. Thanks. And Kate. Uh, we've really tried to be, uh, you know, separate from the work around keeping everybody healthy, safe, um, and building an equitable and just community. We've tried to be opportunistic, and that includes for us actually doing 
um, some construction work on campus while students were away. Um, and we got much better prices on that work. Uh, it was safer because we didn't have people moving in and out. And it allowed us to um, use employees who were otherwise not going to be, um, have a job to do. Um, because uh, we weren't on campus. So that has been positive for us. We're accelerating the work that we had um, planned in terms of our academic program and our use of time. Um, so really, uh, we had already decided to move into a 12-month um, sort of school schedule and um, use a, a true try, but also um, like Dar Dartmouth does, use um, have students on and off campus at different times of the year. And in fact, this is um, going to be both necessary and valuable as a result of um, COVID-19. And I think that our, our community is seeing it as uh, an opportunity and a positive response, but we, uh, we've told them we're not going back um, to that. So it, it's helped that sort of change agenda, um, but we're being, um, uh, you know, we're really accelerating those changes and also being honest about it. It's also an opportunity for us because students are not on campus and things will be different next year to change some of the traditions and other routines that are hard to change sometimes because we know that our students will have a whole group of students that miss the spring um, and a new group of students that are coming on. Um, that have, have not experienced that. So you sort of will have half of the school that will have had a disrupted time. Um, and it's an op optimal time to, to interrupt some of the things um, that have been on the list. So. And maybe some of these changes will end up being welcome changes forced upon us, right? But in exactly. the context, um, the forced experiment that is this pandemic uh, of so many institutions in our society, schools being the one that we're most concerned with, of course. Yeah. And I think remind people that many of the things that we're talking about um, are always on our list. We've always had a contagious disease um, policy and we've struggled with getting students to wash their hands and go to the health center when they have the regular flu or they have strep throat. Um, we've always had um, local guardians, but we haven't had to use them. And so that has been a struggle. So, so really looking at some of those things um, and it's not all new, um, but, but um, perhaps really moving forward in terms of um, health and wellness and, um, and, and our work around right. teaching and learning at the, at the very sure. highest levels. Uh, thanks Thank you, to uh, NIASC for convening us and for being thought leaders with respect to all of the uh, work uh, that is ahead of us. And I uh, look forward to hearing more. Take care. Thank you, Kate. Thank all right. You. Thank you. I know you have to drop off. Okay. Take care. Um, and Mark, if we can go to you and then to Kathy, just final sort of thoughts from um, your perspective on how you're leaning in and making the most of this moment. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to start by a quote by Winston Churchill, so never waste a good crisis. Uh, I mean, there's no question about it, you know, the next year is going to be tough for all boarding schools to some extent or another. At the same time, it is breaking certain habits. Uh, it is also uh, essentially using technology. We were we sort of knew, but we're using now to a fuller extent. I mean, I think it is going to potentially change over long term uh, the the ways of teaching and learning in a, in, in a positive way. And, and I think it's forcing also, uh, you know, we're in the business of, of growth, of, of education. Well, that, that now applies not just to the students, but also applies to us, whether we're head of school or teachers. And I think uh, it's essentially modeling a growth mindset. Uh, maybe one thing I think that has also been sort of interesting that came out is, is just a partnership with parents. Now, as an international school, we, we only have about maybe 30% uh, of our student, the parents who are native or close to native English speakers. Well, you know, we've also, this, this crisis as we've gone into our remote learning program has also offered an opportunity to strengthen those partnerships ships with our parents all over the world and what is it that they want? How can we support them um, and, and engage them more in the teaching and learning uh, of our students? And I, I thought that was a very powerful outcome, which I certainly did not anticipate when we had to send the kids home. Yeah, great. Thank you, Mark. Um, and Kathy. So, um, you know, I, I think the growth mindset is terrific. 
Um, I'm also getting a whole lot of good feedback about the power of empathetic leadership right now. And, and I'm not going to get her name, but the leader of New Zealand uh, comes right to mind, as well as the uh, health director for the state of Ohio. Um, so I've actually spent a little time trying to, trying to get some leadership pointers from people outside of our field. I also think that it, there is absolutely no substitute for the kind of collegiality that, that uh, we often don't have time for, and sometimes our competitive fences um, come up, and now's not the time for that. Um, this is an acutely local situation, um, and it's really time to be building those connections. Um, I think it's also important to help people realize that anxiety comes from uncertainty. Totally natural, totally real, but, but we have been here. Um, yesterday, in talking with an infectious disease guy, he was talking to me about um, the SARS COVID outbreak of years ago, and how we handled that, and how we handle flu, and um, you know, I think the situation has been uh, made much more complex with confusion and fear. So part of our job at leader, as leaders is to, is to calm those waters. I've been saying we, you know, we lean in, we show up, and we shine. And you would be surprised if when you put a little language out there in the water, you know, strong, resilient, optimistic, that's us. And if you say it enough, people start to believe it about themselves and about the organization. Um, and, and we want what you want. We want to be the school you chose to come to. And here's, here's our path to getting there. And we can do this, strong, resilient, optimistic. And then finally, for me, it's a really important time to take care of people. Um, I have, I've been blessed. You know, it's my first year at St. Paul School, but I've been a head of school for a long time. So I'm getting to know my team. Um, and I'm just so pleased and proud of the way they've leaned in to the graduation videos, to the packing of kids' stuff to the IT heroes, you know, we talk about our IT heroes here, catch, it, catch people being good and say thank you however you possibly can um, and share that, you know, share that both the responsibility for leadership and the wealth. And, and you have to step away from your email school leaders and you have to, um, you know, at a time where we're all super plugged in, we have to, we have to make sure that we don't dry out. And that we don't, you know, that when we get discouraged and tired, there are places we can go, even if we can't go anywhere, but there are places we can go in our lives that, that rejuvenate us so that when we need to say to people, yes, we can, yes, we will, that we can say that with kind of conviction that, again, trust and confidence, um, you know, builds trust and confidence in us. So take good care of yourself and your people in all of this while we're working so hard. Thanks, you, Kathy. Great message. Um, Pelham, some final thoughts on uh, how you're going to be leaning in and are currently leaning into this moment to take advantage. Um, there's, there's little to add to the many outstanding suggestions which have been given so far. I'm, I'm really so in awe of the many ideas which have been forthcoming. I, I just feel it's very much is an opportunity for us to do things differently, to, to take the moment, um, and particularly around, around student autonomy and student responsibility. I think that's something which is very significant for us to really, really focus on. Um, involving students in, in how we do things, in, in um, agreeing on protocols and so on. And I hope that the changes that we can bring about um, won't be kicked back to the old normal um, by a focus on exams and results and, and all the rest of standardized testing. I, I feel there's a real opportunity for us to move, move forwards and I hope that the whole system can move forwards um, and not, not, you know, if this is over more quickly than, than it might be, I, let's hope so, but we're just, we don't just switch back to, to the things we were doing before and that we can stick with, with the changes we're, we're bringing into place. Important message. Thank you, Pelham. And then Brad, please, how are you leaning in, taking advantage of this moment? I think I would title that um, how I'm stopped worrying and starting to love Zoom. And uh, I think one thing I've really found is it's opened a new world for us. And one example is we can now control our observatory through Zoom. So instead of getting two or three people up in our observatory on an evening, we're getting a couple hundred people. We're collaborating with a school in California and a college in Vermont. And it just makes me think about internet of things and how do we collaborate I'm looking at our, at our attendee list. We have people from India, South Korea, Europe. Um, how do we, what if we had carbon measuring devices on our, our campuses and our students could compare carbon capturing in, in different parts of the world? What if we, those of us who have solar power could compare what's happening to our solar power readouts on a given day? What if 
Um, you think of it, so many things we can do remotely. What if our choirs combined? What if, uh, like we're doing with the Asani schools and having coffee houses across schools? Um, it's really amazing the power we're seeing. And like, like Kathy said, it, this is a time for collaboration. This is a time for coming together and finding solutions and really doing incredible things. So when parents think boarding school, they say, wow, it's not just double school. It's this network of schools and people and activities. Um, that's what gets me excited. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Taking it to the next level. You know, and I'm, I'm, I'm uh, going to paraphrase Frank Sinatra about how you all have managed this, because if you can make it there in a boarding school, then you can make it anywhere. And I know a lot of our listeners, and there are still 436 people on this call, um, are from day schools and have questions about you know, day students within boarding schools as well. I don't think we're gonna get to all those questions, unfortunately, but you all have provided so much important, helpful, relevant, um, significant information and inspiration, I would say, um, through your sharing this morning. Um, one final question before we do wrap up, though, I'd like to have each of you in 10 words or less Tell us what is your greatest challenge right now? What is your greatest challenge in 10 words or less before we bring it to a close? And I will um, just ask for you to raise your hand to let me know when you're ready to share your 10 words or less on the greatest challenge you're facing right now. Pelham. The Chinese foreign ministry and visas for our foreign faculty. That's probably nine words who are overseas, 12 words. <laughs> okay. Understood. Thank you. Uh, Mark. International air travel, three words. All right. So we bank seven more words so you can go over if you need to, anyone else. <laughs> um, uh, Brad, go ahead. Just say the health and safety of our faculty and staff and their families. Great. Well done. Yeah, John. I would just echo Brad. I mean, taking care of our team in a time where we have a different relationship with them. Great. Kathy, you got your... I got my 10 words. Much to learn, much will change, smartest planning possible. Well put. Jennifer. I would say that... Uh, Definitely multitasking is a challenge for everybody here. I, I agree with all the things I've heard, but going forward, uh, you have multiple paths to travel at once. Great. All right. I think I got everybody right. Okay. So we will be, um, thank you again, everybody. I'm going to turn it over to Jim in, um, in, in, a, in a sec, um, but I want to just uh, shout out uh, to my colleague, Jim, um, my colleague Jay Stroud, um, who also helped organize this morning, uh, Selena, who's in the background, uh, along with um, Francis, who has been doing great work uh, keeping us up to date with the various links. Thank you for keeping uh, track of the chat. And to our panelists and co-host Jeff and everyone at NIAS, this is Jim Mooney signing off. Thank you all very, very much for your time and for your remarkable uh, thoughts. Uh, we're in good hands. Thank you for your good work.